Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Crochet Every, Do Every Day with Judy. We're continuing reading from Jane Eyre today, starting with Chapter 6. The next day commenced as before getting up and dressing by rushlight, but this morning we were obliged to dispense with the ceremony of washing. The water in the pitchers was frozen. A change had taken place in the weather the preceding evening, and a keen northeast wind whistling through the crevices of our bedroom windows all night long had made us shiver in our beds and turned the contents of the ewers to ice. Before the long hour and a half of prayers and Bible reading was over, I felt ready to perish with cold. Breakfast time came at last, and this morning the porridge was not burnt. The quality was eatable, the quantity small. How small my portion seemed. I wished it had been doubled. In the course of the day, I was enrolled a member of the fourth class, and regular tasks and occupations were assigned me. Hitherto, I had only been a spectator of the proceedings at Lowood. I was now to become an actor therein. At first, being little accustomed to learn by heart, the lessons appeared to me both long and difficult. The frequent change from task to task, too, bewildered me, and I was glad when, about three o'clock in the afternoon, Miss Smith put into my hands a border of muslin two yards long, together with needle, thimble, etc., and sent me to sit in a quiet corner of the schoolroom with directions to hem the same. At that hour, most of the others were sewing likewise, but one class still stood round Miss Scratchard's chair reading, and as all was quiet, the subject of their lessons could be heard, together with the manner in which, in which each girl acquitted herself and the animadversions or commendations of Miss Scratchard on the performance. <clears throat> it was English history. Among the readers, I observed my acquaintance of the veranda. At the commencement of the lesson, her place had been at the top of the class. But for some error of pronunciation or some inattention to stops, she was suddenly sent to the very bottom. Even in that obscure position, Miss Scratchard continued to make her an object of constant notice. She was continually addressing to her such phrases as the following, Burns. Such, it seemed, was her name. The girls here were all called by their surnames, as boys are elsewhere. Burns, you are standing on the side of your shoe. Turn your toes out immediately. Burns, you poke your chin most unpleasantly. Draw it in. Burns, I insist on your holding your head up. I will not have you before me in that attitude, etc., etc. A chapter having been read through twice, the books were closed and the girls examined. The lesson had comprised part of the reign of Charles I, and there were sundry questions about tonnage and poundage and ship money, which most of them appeared unable to answer. Still, every little difficulty was solved instantly when it reached Burns. Her memory seemed to have retained the substance of the whole lesson, and she was ready with answers on every point. I kept expecting that Miss Scratchard would praise her attention, but instead of that, she suddenly cried out, You dirty, disagreeable girl, you have never cleaned your nails this morning. Burns made no answer. I wondered at her silence. Why, thought I, does she not explain that she could neither clean her nails nor wash her face as the water was frozen? My attention was now called off by Miss Smith desiring me to hold a skein of thread. While she was winding it, she talked to me from time to time, asking whether I had ever been at school before, whether I could mark, stitch, knit, etc. Till she dismissed me, I could not pursue my observations on Miss Scratchard's movements. When I returned to my seat, that lady was just delivering an order of which I did not catch the import, but Burns immediately left the class and, going into the smaller inner room where the books were kept, returned in half a minute, carrying in her hand a bundle of twigs tied together at one end. This ominous tool she presented to Miss Scratchard with a respectful curtsy, then she quietly, and without being told, unloosed her pinafore, and the teacher instantly and sharply inflicted on her neck a dozen strokes with the bunch of twigs. <clears throat> Not a tear rose to Burns' eye, and while I paused from my sewing, because my fingers quivered at this spectacle with a sentiment of unavailing and impotent anger, not a feature of her pensive face altered its ordinary expression. Hardened girl, exclaimed Miss Scratchard, nothing can correct you of your slatternly habits. Carry the rod away. Burns obeyed. I looked at her narrowly as she emerged from the book closet. She was just putting back her handkerchief into her pocket, and the trace of a tear glistened on her thin cheek. The play hour in the evening I thought the pleasantest fraction of the day at Lowood. The bit of bread, the draught of coffee swallowed at five o'clock had revived vitality if it had not satisfied hunger. The long restraint of the day was slackened. The schoolroom felt warmer than in the morning, its fires being allowed to burn a little more brightly to supply in some measure the place of candles not yet introduced. The ruddy gloaming, the licensed uproar, the confusion of many voices gave one a welcome sense of liberty. 
On the evening of the day on which I had seen Miss Scratchard flog her pupil Burns, I wandered as usual among the forms and tables and laughing groups without a companion, yet not feeling lonely. When I passed the windows, I now and then lifted a blind and looked out. It snowed fast. A drift was already forming against the lower panes. Putting my ear close to the window, I could distinguish from the gleeful tumult within the disconsolate moan of the wind outside. Probably, if I had lately left a good home and kind parents, this would have been the hour when I should most keenly have regretted the separation. That wind would then have saddened my heart. This obscure chaos would have disturbed my peace. As it was, I derived from both a strange excitement, and reckless and feverish I wished the wind to howl more wildly, the gloom to deepen to darkness, and the confusion to rise to clamor. Jumping over forms and creeping under tables, I made my way to one of the fireplaces. There, kneeling by the high wire fender, I found Burns, absorbed, silent, abstracted from all round her by the companionship of a book, which she read by the dim glare of the embers. Is it still restless? I asked, coming behind her. Yes, she said, and I have just finished it. And in five minutes more, she shut it up. I was glad of this. Now, thought I, I can perhaps get her to talk. I sat down by her on the floor. What is your name besides Burns? Helen. Do you come a long way from here? I come from a place farther north, quite on the borders of Scotland. Will you ever go back? I hope so, but nobody can be sure of the future. You must wish to leave Lowood? No, why should I? I was sent to Lowood to get an education, and it would be of no use going away until I obtained that object. But that teacher, Miss Scratchard, is so cruel to you. Cruel? Not at all. She's severe. She dislikes my faults. And if I were in your place, I should dislike her. I should resist her. If she struck me with that rod, I should get it from her hand. I should break it under her nose. Probably you would do nothing of the sort, but if you did, Mr. Brocklehurst would expel you from the school. That would be a great grief to your relations. It is far better to endure patiently a smart, which nobody feels but yourself, than to commit a hasty action whose evil consequences will extend to all connected with you. And besides, the Bible bids us return good for evil. But then it seems disgraceful to be flogged and to be sent to stand in the middle of a room full of people, and you are such a great girl. I am far younger than you, and I could not bear it. Yet it would be your duty to bear it if you could not avoid it. It is weak and silly to say you cannot bear what it is your fate to be required to bear. I heard her with wonder. I could not comprehend this doctrine of endurance, and still less could I understand or sympathize with the forbearance she expressed for her chastiser. Still, I felt that Helen Burns considered things by a light invisible to my eyes. I suspected she might be right and I wrong, but I would not ponder the matter deeply. Like Felix, I put it off to a more convenient season. You say you have faults, Helen. What are they? To me, you seem very good. Then learn from me not to judge by appearances. I am, as Miss Scratchard said, slatternly. I seldom put and never keep things in order. I am careless. I forget rules. I read when I should learn my lessons. I have no method, and sometimes I say, like you, I cannot bear to be subjected to systematic arrangements. This is all very provoking to Miss Scratchard, who is naturally neat, punctual, and particular. And cross and cruel, I added, but Helen Burns would not admit my addition. She kept silence. Is Miss Temple as severe to you as Miss Scratchard? At the utterance of Miss Temple's name, a soft smile flitted over her grave face. Miss Temple is full of goodness. It pains her to be severe to anyone, even the worst in the school. She sees my errors and tells me of them gently, and if I do anything worthy of praise, she gives me my mead liberally. One strong proof of my wretchedly defective nature is that even her expostulations, so mild, so rational, so rational, have not influenced to cure me of my faults, and even her praise, though I value it most highly, cannot stimulate me to continued care and foresight. That is curious, said I. It is so easy to be careful. For you, I have no doubt it is. I observed you in your class this morning and saw you were closely attentive. Your thoughts never seemed to wander while Miss Miller explained the lesson and questioned you. Now mine continually rove away when I should be listening to Miss Scratchard and collecting all she says with assiduity. Often I lose the very sound of her voice. I fall into a sort of dream. Sometimes I think I am in Northumberland and that the noises I hear round me are the bubbling of a little brook which runs through deep down near our house. Then when it comes to my turn to reply, I have to be awakened and having heard nothing of what was read for listening to the visionary brook, I have no answer ready. Yet how well you replied this afternoon. It was mere chance. The subject on which we had been reading had interested me. 
This afternoon, instead of dreaming of Deepton, I was wondering how a man who wished to do right could act so unjustly and unwisely as Charles I sometimes did, and I thought what a pity it was that with his integrity and conscientiousness he could see no farther than the prerogatives of the crown. If he had been able to look to a distance and see how what they call the spirit of the age was tending, still, I like Charles. I respect him. I pity him, poor murdered king. Yes, his enemies were the worst. They shed blood they had no right to shed. How dared they kill him? Helen was talking to herself now. She had forgotten I could not very well understand her, that I was ignorant or nearly so of the subjects she discussed. I recalled her to my level. And when Miss Temple teaches you, do your thoughts wander then? No, certainly not often, because Miss Temple has generally something to say which is newer than my own reflections. Her language is singularly agreeable to me, and the information she communicates is often just what I wish to gain. Well, then, with Miss Temple you are good? Yes, in a passive way. I make no effort. I follow as inclination guides me. There is no merit in such goodness. A great deal. <clears throat> you are good to those who are good to you. It is all I ever desire to be. If people, if people were always kind and obedient to those who are cruel and unjust, the wicked people would have it all their own way. They would never feel afraid, and so they would never alter, but would grow worse and worse. When we are struck at without a reason, we should strike back again very hard. I am sure we should, so hard as to teach the person who struck us never to do it again. You will change your mind, I hope, when you grow older. As yet, you are but a little untaught girl. But I feel this, Helen. I must dislike those who, whatever I do to please them, persist in disliking me. I must resist those who punish me unjustly. It is as natural as that I should love those who show me affection or submit to punishment when I feel it is deserved. Heathens and savage tribes hold that doctrine, but Christians and civilized nations disown it. How? I don't understand. It is not violence that best overcomes hate, nor vengeance that most certainly heals injury. What then? Read the New Testament and observe what Christ says and how he acts. Make his word your rule and his conduct your example. What does he say? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you. Then I should love Mrs. Reed, which I cannot do. I should bless her son John, which is impossible. In her turn, Helen Burns asked me to explain, and I proceeded forthwith to pour out in my own way the tale of my sufferings and resentments. Bitter and truculent when excited, I spoke as I felt without reserve or softening. Helen heard me patiently to the end. I expected she would then make a remark, but she said nothing. Well, I asked impatiently, is not Mrs. Reed a hard-hearted bad woman? She has been unkind to you, no doubt, because, you see, she dislikes your cast of character, as Miss Scratchard does mine. But how minutely you remember all she has done and said to you. What a singularly deep impression her injustice seems to have made on your heart. No ill usage so brands its record on my feelings. Would you not be happier if you tried to forget her severity, together with the passionate emotions it excited? Life appears to me too short to be spent in nursing animosity or registering wrongs. We are and must be one and all burdened with faults in this world, but the time will soon come when I trust we shall put them off in putting off we should shall put them off in putting off of our corruptible bodies, when debasement and sin will fall from us with this cumbrous frame of flesh, and only the spark of the spirit will remain. The impalpable principle of light and thought, pure as when it left the creator to inspire the creature, whence it came to it will return perhaps again to be communicated to some being higher than man, perhaps to pass through gradations of glory from the pale human soul to brighten, the, to, to, brighten to the seraph. Surely it will never, on the contrary, be suffered to, to degenerate from man to fiend. No, I cannot believe that. I hold another creed, which no one ever taught me, and which I seldom mention, but in which I delight and to which I cling, for it extends hope to all. It makes eternity a rest, a mighty home, not a terror and an abyss. Besides, with this creed, I can so clearly distinguish between the criminal and his crime. I can so sincerely forgive the first while I abhor the last. With this creed, revenge never worries my heart, degradation never too deeply disgusts me, injustice never crushes me too low. I live in calm looking to the end. 
Helen's head, always drooping, sank a little lower as she finished the sentence. I saw by her look she wished no longer to talk to me, but rather to converse with her own thoughts. She was not allowed much time for meditation. A monitor, a great rough girl, presently came up, exclaiming in a strong Cumberland accent, Helen Burns, if you don't go and put your drawer in order and fold up your work this minute, I'll tell Miss Scratcher to come and look at it. Helen sighed as a reverie fled, and getting up, obeyed the monitor without reply, as without delay. Chapter 7 my first quarter at Lowood seemed an age, and not the golden age either. It comprised an irksome struggle with difficulties in habituating myself to new rules and unwanted tasks. The fear of failure in these points harassed me worse than the physical hardships of my lot, though these were no trifles. During January, February, and part of March, the deep snows and after their melting, the almost impassable roads prevented our stirring beyond the garden walls except to go to church. But within these limits, we had to pass an hour every day in the open air. Our clothing was insufficient to protect us from the severe cold. We had no boots. The snow got into our shoes and melted there. Our ungloved hands became numbed and covered with chilblains, as were our feet. I remember well the distracting irritation I endured from this cause every evening when my feet inflamed and the torture of thrusting the swelled, raw, and stiff toes into my shoes in the morning. Then the scanty supply of food was distressing. With the keen appetites of growing children, we had scarcely sufficient to keep alive a delicate invalid. From this deficiency of nourishment resulted an abuse which pressed hardly on the younger pupils. Whenever the famished great girls had an opportunity, they would coax or menace the little ones out of their portion. Many a time I have shared between two claimants the precious morsel of brown bread distributed at tea time, and after relinquishing to a third half the contents of my mug of coffee, I have swallowed the remainder with an accompaniment of secret tears forced from me by the exigency of hunger. Sundays were drear, dreary days in that wintry season. We had to walk two miles to Brocklebridge Church, where our patron officiated. We set out cold. We arrived at church colder. During the morning service, we became almost paralyzed. It was too far to return to dinner, and an allowance of cold meat and bread in the same penurious proportion observed in our ordinary meals was served round between the services. At the close of the afternoon service, we returned by an exposed and hilly road where the bitter winter, bitter winter wind blowing over a range of snowy summits to the north almost flayed the skin from our faces. I can remember Miss Temple walking lightly and rapidly along our drooping line. Her plaid cloak, which the frosty wind fluttered, gathered close about her and encouraging us by precept and example to keep up our spirits and march forward, as she said, like stalwart soldiers. The other teachers, poor things, were generally themselves too much dejected to attempt the task of cheering others. How we longed for the light and heat of a blazing fire when we got back, but to the little ones at least this was denied. Each hearth in the schoolroom was immediately surrounded by a double row of great girls, and behind them the younger children crunched in groups, wrapping their starved arms in their pinafores. A little solace came at tea time in the shape of a double ration of bread, a whole instead of a half slice, with the delicious addition of a thin scrape of butter. It was the abdominal treat to which we all looked forward from Sabbath to Sabbath. I generally contrived to reserve a moiety of this bounteous repast for myself, but the remainder I was invariably obli obligated to part with. The Sunday evening was spent in repeating by heart the church catechism and the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of St. Matthew, and in listening to a long sermon read by Miss Miller, whose irrepressible yawns attested her weariness. A frequent interlude of these performances was the enactment of the part of Eutychus by some half-dozen of little girls, who, overpowered with sleep, would fall down if not out of the third loft, yet off the fourth form, and be taken up half-dead. The remedy was to thrust them forward into the center of the schoolroom and oblige them to stand there till the sermon was finished. Sometimes their feet failed them and they sank together in a heap. They were then propped up with the monitor's high stools. I have not yet alluded to the visits of Mr. Brocklehurst, and indeed that gentleman was from home during the greater part of the first month after my arrival, perhaps prolonging his stay with his friend the archdeacon. His absence was a relief to me. I need not say that I had my own reasons for dreading his coming, but come at last, he did. One afternoon, I had then been three weeks at Lowood, I was sitting with a slate in my hand, puzzling over a sum in long division. My eyes raised in abstraction to the window, caught sight of a figure just passing. 
I recognized almost instinctively that gaunt outline, and when two minutes after all the school, teachers included, rose en masse, it was not necessary for me to look up in order to ascertain whose entrance they thus greeted. A long stride measured the schoolroom, and presently beside Miss Temple, who herself had risen, stood the same black column which had frowned on me so ominously from the hearthrug of Gateshead. I now glanced sideways at this piece of architecture. Yes, I was right. It was Mr. Brocklehurst, buttoned up in a surtout, and looking longer, narrower, and more rigid than ever. I had my own reasons for being dismayed at this apparition. Too well I remembered the perfidious hints given by Mrs. Reed about my disposition, etc. The promise pledged by Mr. Brocklehurst to apprise Miss Temple and the teachers of my vicious nature. All along, I had been dreading the fulfillment of this promise. I had been looking out daily for the coming man whose information respecting my past life and conversation was to brand me as a bad child forever. Now, here, there he was. He stood at Miss Temple's side. He was speaking low in her ear. I did not doubt he was making disclosures of my villainy, and I watched her eye with painful anxiety, expecting every moment to see its dark orb turn on me a glance of repugnance and contempt. I listened, too, and as I happened to be seated quite at the top of the room, I caught most of what he said. Its import relieved me from immediate apprehension. I suppose, Miss Temple, the thread I bought at Lowton will do. It struck me that it would be just of the quality for the calico chemises, and I sorted the needles to match. You may tell Miss Smith that I forgot to make a memorandum of the darning needles, but she shall have some papers sent in next week, and she is not on any account to give out more than one at a time to each pupil, for if they have more, they are apt to be careless and lose them. And, oh, ma'am, I wish the woolen stockings were better looked to. When I was here last, I went to the kitchen garden and examined the clothes drying on the line. There was a quantity of black hose in very bad state of repair. From the size of the holes in them, I was sure they had not been well mended from time to time. He paused. Your directions shall be attended to, sir, said Miss Temple. And, ma'am, he continued, the laundress tells me some of the girls have two clean tuckers in the week. It is too much. The rules limit them to one. I think I can explain that circumstance, sir. Agnes and Catherine Johnstone were invited to take tea with some friends at Lowton last Thursday, and I gave them leave to put on clean tuckers for the occasion. Mr. Brocklehurst nodded. Well, for once it may pass, but please not to let the circumstance occur too often. And there is another thing which surprised me. I find in settling accounts with the housekeeper that a lunch consisting of bread and cheese has twice been served out to the girls during the past fortnight. How is this? I looked over the regulations, and I find no such meal as lunch mentioned. Who introdu introduced this innovation, and by what authority? I must be responsible for the circumstance, sir, replied Miss Temple. The breakfast was so ill-prepared that the pupils could not possibly eat it, and I dared not allow them to remain fasting till dinner time. Madam, allow me an instant. You are aware that my plan in bringing up these girls is not to accustom them to habits of luxury and indulgence, but to render them hardy, patient, self-denying. Should any little accidental disappointment of the appetite occur, such as the spoiling of a meal, the under- or the overdressing of a dish, the incident ought not to be neutralized by replacing with something more delicate the comfort lost, thus pampering the body and obviating the aim of this institution." It ought to be improved to the spiritual edification of the pupils by encouraging them to evince fortitude under the temporary probation. A brief address on those occasions would not be mistimed wherein a judicious instructor would take the opportunity of referring to the sufferings of the, the primitive Christians, to the torments of martyrs, to the exhortations of our blessed Lord himself, calling upon his disciples to take up their cross and follow him, to his warnings that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, to his divine consolations, if ye suffer hunger or thirst for my sake, happy are ye. Oh, madam, when you put bread and cheese instead of burnt porridge into these children's mouths, you may indeed feed their vile bodies, but you little think how you starve their immortal souls. Mr. Brockhurst again paused, perhaps overcome by his feelings. Miss Temple had looked down when he first began to speak to her, but she now gazed straight before her, and her face, naturally pale as marble, appeared to be assuming also the coldness and fixity of that material, especially her mouth closed as if it would have required a sculptor's chisel to open it, and her brow settled gradually into petrified severity. Meantime, Mr. Brocklehurst, standing on the hearth with his hands behind his back, majestically surveyed the whole school. Suddenly his eye gave a blink as if it had met something that either dazzled or shocked its pupil. Turning, he said in more rapid accents than he had hitherto used, Miss Temple, Miss Temple, what, what is that girl with curled hair? Red hair, ma'am, curled. 
curled all over, and extending his cane, pointed to the awful object, his hands shaking as he did so. It is Julia Severn, replied Miss Temple very quietly. Julia Severn, ma'am, and why has she or any other curled hair? Why, in defiance of every precept and principle of this house, does she conform to the world so openly, here in an evangelical charitable establishment, as to wear her hair one mass of curls? Julia's hair curls naturally, replied Miss Temple, still more quietly. Naturally, yes, but we are not to conform to nature. I wish these girls to be the children of grace. And why that abundance? I have again and again intimated that I desire the hair to be arranged closely, modestly, plainly, Miss Temple. That girl's hair must be caught off, cut off entirely. I will send a barber tomorrow, and I see others who have far too much of the excrescence. That tall girl, tell her to turn around. Tell all the first form to rise up and direct their faces to the wall. Miss Temple passed her handkerchief over her lips as if to smooth away the involuntary smile that curled them. She gave the order, however, and when the first class could take in what was required of them, they obeyed. Leaning a little way back on my bench, I could see the looks and grimaces with which they commented on this maneuver. It was a pity Mr. Brocklehurst could not see them, too. He would perhaps have felt that whatever he might do with the outside of the cup and platter, the inside was further beyond his interference than he imagined. He scrutinized the reverse of these living metals some five minutes, then pronounced sentence. These words fell like the knell of doom. All those top knots must be cut off. Miss Temple seemed to, to remonstrate. Madam, he pursued, I have a master to serve whose kingdom is not of this world. My mission is to mortify in these girls the lust of, of the flesh, to teach them to clothe themselves with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair and costly apparel. And each of the young persons before us has a string of hair twisted in plates which vanity itself might have woven. These, I repeat, must be cut off. Think of the time wasted, of... Mr. Brocklehurst was here interrupted. Three other visitors, ladies, now entered the room. They ought to have come a little sooner, sooner to have heard his lecture on dress, for they were splendidly attired in velvet, silk, and furs. The two younger of the trio, fine girls of sixteen and seventeen, had gray beaver hats, then in fashion, shaded with ostrich plumes, and from under the brim of this graceful headdress fell a profusion of light tresses, elaborately curled. The elder lady was enveloped in a costly velvet shawl, trimmed with ermine, and she wore a false front of French curls. These ladies were deferentially received by Miss Temple as Mrs. and the Mrs. Brocklehurst, and conducted to seats of honor at the top of the room. It seems they had come in the carriage with their reverend relative and had been conducting a rummaging scrutiny of the rooms upstairs while he transacted, transacted business with the housekeeper, questioned the laundress, and lectured to the superintendent. They now proceeded to address diverse remarks and reproofs to Miss, to Miss Smith, who was charged with the care of the linen and the inspection of the dormitories. But I had no time to listen to what they said. Other matters called off and enchained my attention. Hitherto, while gathering up the discourse of Mr. Brocklehurst and Miss Temple, I had not at the same time neglected precautions to secure my personal safety, which I thought would be effected if I could only elude observation. To this end, I had sat well back on the foreman while seeming to be busy with my son, had held my slate in such a manner as to conceal my face. I might have escaped notice had not my treacherous slate somehow slip, happened to slip from my hand and falling with an obtrusive crash directly drawn every eye upon me. I knew it was all over now, as, and as I stooped to pick up the two fragments of slate, I rallied my forces for the worst. It came. A careless girl, said Mr. Brocklehurst, and immediately after, it is the new pupil, I perceive, and before I could draw breath, I must not forget I have a word to say respecting her. Then aloud, how loud it seemed to me, let the child who broke her slate come forward. Of my own accord, I could not have stirred. I was paralyzed. But the two great girls who sat on each side of me set me on my legs and pushed me toward the dread judge, and then Miss Temple gently assisted me to his feet, to his very feet, and I caught her whispered counsel. Don't be afraid, Jane. I saw it was an accident. You shall not be punished. The kind whisper went to my heart like a dagger. Another minute and she will despise me for a hypocrite, thought I, and an impulse of fury against Reed, Brocklehurst, and company bounded in my pulses at the conviction. I was no Helen Burns. Fetch that stool, said Mr. Brocklehurst, pointing to a very high one from which a monitor had just risen. It was brought. Place the child upon it. And I was placed there by whom I don't know. I was in no condition to note particulars. I was only aware that they had hoisted me up to the height of Mr. Brocklehurst's nose, that he was within a yard of me, and that a spread of shot orange and purple silk pelisses and a cloud of silvery plumage extended and waved below me. Mr. Brocklehurst hemmed. Ladies, said he, turning to his family, 
Miss Temple, teachers and children, you all see this girl? Of course they did, for I felt their eyes directed like burning glasses against my scorched skin. You see, she is yet young. You observe she possesses the ordinary form of childhood. God has graciously given her the shape that he has given to all of us. No signal deformity points her out as a marked character. Who would think that the evil one has already found a servant and agent in her? Yet such, I grieve to say, is the case. A pause in which I began to study the palsy of my nerves and to feel that the Rubicon was passed and that the trial no longer to be shirked must be firmly sustained. My dear children, pursued the black marble clergyman with pathos, this is a sad, a melancholy occasion, for it becomes my duty to warn you that this girl, who might be one of God's own lambs, is a little castaway, not a member of the true flock, but evidently an interloper and an alien. You must be on your guard against her. You must shun her example. If necessary, avoid her company, exclude her from your sports, and shut her out from your converse. Teachers, you must watch her. Keep your eyes on her movements, weigh well her words, scrutinize her actions, Punish her body to save her soul, if indeed such salvation be possible. For my tongue falters while I tell this. This girl, this child, the native of a Christian land, worse than many a little heathen who says its prayers to Brahma and kneels before Juggernaut, this girl is a liar. Now came a pause of ten minutes, during which I, by this time in perfect possession of my wits, observed all the female Brocklehurst produce their pocket handkerchiefs and apply them to their optics, while the elderly lady swayed herself to and fro, and the two younger ones whispered, How shocking! Mr. Brocklehurst resumed. This I learned from her benefactress, from the pious and charitable lady who adopted her in her orphan state, reared her as her own daughter, and whose kindness, whose generosity, the unhappy girl repaid by an ingratitude so bad, so dreadful, that at last her excellent patroness was obliged to separate her from her own young ones, fearful lest her vicious example should contaminate their purity. She has sent her here to be healed, even as the Jews of old sent their disease to the troubled pool of Bethesda. And teachers, superintendent, I beg of you not to allow the waters to stag stagnate round her. With this sublime conclusion, Mr. Brocklehurst adjusted the top button of his surtout, muttered something to his family, who rose, bowed to Miss Temple, and then all the great people sailed in state from the room. Turning at the door, my judge said, let her stand half an hour longer on that stool and let no one speak to her during the remainder of the day. There was I then mounted aloft. I, who had said I could not bear the shame of standing on my natural feet in the middle of the room, was now exposed I'm sorry, was now exposed to general view on a pedestal of infamy. What my sensations were, no language can describe. But just as they all rose, stifling my breath and constricting my throat, a girl came up and passed me. In passing, she lifted her eyes. What a strange light inspired them. What an extraordinary sensation that ray sent through me. How the new feeling bore me up. It was as if a martyr, a hero, had passed a slave or victim and imparted strength in the transit. I mastered the rising hysteria, lifted up my head, and took a firm stand on the stool. Helen Burns asked some slight question about her work of Miss Smith, was chidden for the triviality of the inquiry, returned to her place, and smiled at me as she again went by. What a smile! I remember it now, and I know that it was the effluence of fine intellect, of true courage. It lit up her marked lineaments, her thin face, her sunken gray eye, like a reflection from the aspect of an angel. Yet at that moment, Helen Burns wore in her arm the untidy badge. Scarcely an hour ago, I had heard her condemned my Miss Scratchard to a dinner of bread and water on the morrow because she had blotted an exercise in copying it out. Such is the imperfect nature of man. Such spots are there on the disk of the clearest planet. And eyes like Miss Scratchard's can only see those minute defects and are blind to the bright, full brightness of the orb. We'll stop there and start next time with Chapter 8. Thank you. Bye-bye.